Good morning or good afternoon to you, depending on where you are. Um, while we're waiting for the slides, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, be on the program. And uh, just we're going to basically go through um, a nutrient management, uh, nutrient capture um, methods um, in, gen in brief. But before that, I was really going to just focus on um, why uh, in New York and other similar states, um, there is the interest and uh, need in many cases to think about uh, nutrient management capture. Can you speak up a bit, Kurt, please? Thanks. Sure. Is this better? OK. Yes. Yeah. OK. So before, we, uh, before I dive into that, uh, I just wanted to share with you, for those of you who may not know, um, New York State is, um, oh, it's, it's been the third largest dairy state for many, many years. Um, I believe Ida, Idaho uh, has surpassed us in the recent past. but. Uh, it's in the top, top ten, uh, excuse me, top five, definitely in the top ten, uh, top five dairy states in the nation. Um, there's a lot of progressive dairy farmers in New York State, and it's a real nice opportunity to be able to work with them in my capacity. Um, this is a map of the state. Um, in the upper uh, left hand, or in the, well, sort of the northwest part of the state, uh, is bounded by Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And then in the central, central part of the state is um, a number of Finger Lakes. Uh, Hugo uh, Lake is the longest lake. Um, it's 40 miles long and up to three miles wide. Um, there's a lot of natural water bodies in the Anirondack region, which is the upper northeast part of the state, and then in the lower Hudson Valley area, um, which is what's leading down towards New York City. There's a lot of uh, water courses as well. So water quality um, is, is a big concern in New York State for um, animal agriculture. As far as uh, the demographics go, currently there's about 52 uh, 100 farms, 5,200 5, dairy farms, excuse me, in New York State. Um, the average size is 120 cows. Uh, largest dairy farm is about 5,000 cows. So, um, mix of farms, and, and as far as the size, this slide shows um, we've got a number of smaller farms, and we've got quite a few um, farms in the middle um, size range, you know, 50 to 99 cows, 100 to 199. Um, you see the cross the top bar there, the number of cows, and then the middle bar, the number of, of uh, farms and the percent of cows on those farms. So the message of this slide is that we have uh, several farms that are in that middle to large CAFO uh, range, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, the, uh, the farms that are going to be most um, apt to think about and consider nutrient capture um, at this point in time are going to be those, those larger farms. So I just mentioned our state's CAFO program. Um, like any other state, 700 cows or more is a large CAFO. But New York State also has a medium CAFO program, um, 300 to 699 cows. Uh, some of you may be aware that the uh, governor last year uh, launched an initiative to uh, lower raise, depending on how you want to look at it, the lower uh, boundary for the medium CAFOs. It used to be 200 cows, but now it's 300 cows. So we do have a medium CAFO program. I think that just exemplifies the fact the state recognizes that um, farming is important and water quality is important and it needs to be um, managed well. So under the state's CAFO program, um, any farm that's a CAFO has to have a comprehensive nutrient management plan prepared by a third party that's certified by the state. Um, two important points under that. One is that most of the time manure is stored um, before it's land applied or recycled to the land base. And the reason for that is largely to store manures to help uh, reduce the impact on receiving water bodies. Um, there is some movement in the state um, to uh, apply manure to a growing crop. The problem has been historically uh, farms that have manure storages, those storages create um, odors, gases that when the uh, when manure is applied in the summer to a growing crop um, in that fashion is the neighbors aren't necessarily too happy. Um, but with the um, increased adaptation and adoption of uh, anaerobic digesters, we um, see a lot of farms now able to apply what I call deodorized manure to a growing crop, which is that lower right-hand corner. That's some digested manure that's put, been put down on a, um, right after a second or third cutting of hay. Um, the upper, the left-hand picture is a device that's um, being developed by, actually by a farmer. This isn't the actual device. Um, but it looks similar to this, where they would uh, just go along and trickle feed uh, row crops, um, processed manure. 
Uh, New York's uh, topography is very interesting. A lot of it's a glaciated area, um, so there's a lot of rolling hills and mountains, and it's not too difficult for um, something that's, a, that's on the ground to move uh, towards a water course through rainfall events um, if it's not properly managed. So there again, just another example why the state's very active in um, the CAPA program and um, in um, ensuring the farmers can continue farming. So I like to say that in New York State, water um, is a resource, and, but yet it's a liability. Um, um, I think in the long term, uh, water's going to be here in New York State, and uh, that's a good thing if you have dairy cows. We just, again, need to be real careful uh, to make sure that we, uh, we minimize the impact on water quality. This is just a, a shot of an example, example of a dairy farm in New York State, in case somebody's interested. Um, the left, left hand side of the picture um, is a milking center, and it's basically the ridge is running uh, up and down in the uh, picture. Um, there's several barns to the left of that. It's not in this image, and then there's a the barn to the right. I guess the message here is that these farms generally grow in size over time. Um, they're not necessarily um, green site dairies in New York like some of the other dairy states have. Um, farms have been here for a long time and, and, and over generations and in more recent past there's been some exponential growth in the industry. So we have a lot of farms that are, um, have some old buildings and uh, newer buildings as well. So. With that being said, I just wanted to go through some reasons why um, um, uh, nutrient separation and capture will, would be of interest. Um, and this goes not just for New York State, but I believe for any state that has dairy cattle and water quality uh, sensitivity um, in mind. So one thing would be to um, decrease the duration of manure storage. This isn't an obvious reason, um, but um, our initial um, Methods of separating and capturing nutrients, um, basically we're using screw press separators. And screw press separators are designed to harvest the bulk of the fibrous material out of manure. And by doing that, um, uh, reduces the volume of manure that a, uh, is to be stored long term. So some farms will put in those systems um, not only to capture nutrients, but um, probably sometimes more importantly for them uh, to uh, increase the duration of the, of the manure storage. They can store manure longer. Uh, another tangible reason is uh, to be able to pump manure uh, longer distances. So again, if the fibrous material comes out, which also includes some nutrients, um, farms can, can pump manure further to uh, satellite storages. Uh, this happens to be a picture of a farm. Um, in the background of that picture is where the dairy is, and then almost in the foreground right uh, behind the first row of trees is a manure storage. It's about 7,000 feet um, of distance between those two and 20, 2, 230 feet of elevation change uphill to the storage. And uh, the farm basically implemented a, a, a system to remove those solids and, of course, some of the nutrients um, so that they can easily, more easily pump it uphill. Uh, moving into maybe some of the more obvious reasons why um, somebody would think about separating nutrients and capturing them um, is to work towards um, achieving the four R's. And so that's being able to apply nutrients at the right, at the right source, the right, so the right source of nutrients at the right rate, which would be based on the crop needs at the right time, i.e. when the crop needs them and at the right place. And that means basically uh, very close to the root zone. So it's, it's more difficult to do that with raw manure um, as opposed to manure that's been treated and nutrients have been captured. Um, and uh, put in a, in a form that could be more easily targeted to um, meeting the four R's. Uh, concentration of nutrients to ease the application of remote, remote locations may be another reason. Um, it, uh, because our farms uh, have, uh, because of the farms have grown, uh, because of the topography of our state, um, a lot of these farms have uh, fields that are can be several miles from the farmstead. The farmstead being where the cows are in the infrastructure. And it costs a lot of money to haul manure um, on a truck for a farm. If you don't know this already, manure is about 90% moisture. So for every 100 gallons of manure, uh, there's 90 gallons of water and 10 per 10 gallons or so of solids, if you want to think of it that way. So the cost of hauling manure around, which has new, new, uh, water that has no nutrient value, is part of the cost of doing business. And um, it does drive the cost up to haul of large distances. So 
could take the nutrients out of manure and concentrate them, it would be a lot cheaper to haul them to further fields, which is very closely tied into the next bullet at the bottom, um, where we talk about the ability to, to uh, export nutrients off the farm. So some farms um, ideally um, would be able to um, export some of their nutrients, um, in other words, get rid of them, and let somebody else use them down the road or on the other side of this watershed or whatever the case may be so that they can uh, um, actually potentially grow. Uh, my neighbor where I live, um, um, their general manager on their dairy farm told me that uh, they have 0.7 acres per cow um, to feed their cows and 1.2 acres per cow to manage their nutrients. So that's a half acre per cow left on the table um, that if they could export nutrients, then they could add cows to feed and make more milk. Another reason would be um, to increase the flexibility of, of crop planting, and that may not be an obvious one, but in the springtime where we um, are experiencing um, more, more uh, variations in our weather events, um, in some, some springs we get a lot of rain, which can creep into that time period of, of planting corn. Um, uh, just a year and a half, or year and a half ago, um, there was many farms that had to actually trade seed varieties because our, our spring got so delayed it got into the cutting into the actual growing season. And so they traded, uh, traded seed varieties for shorter seed corn. Um, but a lot of that um, also is complicated because they have to put their manure out in the spring before the um, crop can be planted. So if the nutrients can be removed and, and uh, then applied later, um, we open up the, the plotting, the planting window for getting uh, crops down. Another reason would be to reduce the cost of spreading manure or recycling nutrients back to land base, as I like to say. Um, this is a picture of a center pivot irrigation system, and if you look closely, that is not clean water coming out of those, uh, the uh, center pivot. Um, that's gray water that's, um, that's basically uh, from a, facility, a farm. So <clears throat> not going to do that without deodorizing the manure, and that can be through, done through anaerobic digestion. But also, if, if the manure or processed manure can be applied in this fashion, talking about um, uh, several orders of magnitude less cost um, to do that versus some of the other ways a farm may actually recycle their nutrients to the land base. Um, this one's apparent. I mean, basically reduce the impact on environment. Um, a lot of the fields in New York and similar states um, that get large, lots of rainfall events um, are tile drained. And so um, it, it's, it's impossible, nearly impossible, I think, to control the weather, it's fair to say. So um, a farm can do the best planning possible, yet a weather event can come in and ground that has tile drain can, um, at times, uh, uh, this, this trains, those tile drainage can transport nutrients uh, to um, a roadside ditch or other receiving water body. And so uh, that's very difficult to uh, preclude in some situations. But um, by uh, separating and capturing nutrients from manure and then dealing with them or managing them otherwise, it's possible to have a, a reduced uh, impact on the environment. I think a question worth asking um, ourselves is on a dairy farm, who pays the bills? And, and uh, the answer is right there in the middle, it's the cows. So um, you know, the farmer writes the check, but the cows are the, one who, the ones who generate the funds that go into the checking account to pay the bills. And so. Um, one of the important points I want to make sure that we all know is that these nutrient management capture systems that are out there are not uh, capital, not without capital cost or operating cost, and um, the, uh, there needs to be a way to pay for those um, over and above the receipts that come from selling milk. So that payment could come from um, reduced cost or actually um, uh, generating a revenue based on um, selling nutrients. I think we'll hear a little bit about that more at one of the other presenters. Um, another option would be is what can we do with the manure that would benefit the cows? And uh, this is a Michigan dairy farm. Uh, this is probably my all-time favorite picture I use. Um, 16 years old now, and uh, the row of cows laying down. And anybody who knows anything about dairy cows uh, will uh, like that picture. Um, those cows are on sand bedding, and sand bedding is a really good thing for cows for a lot of reasons. Um, but on the back end of the barn, uh, managing sand late manure is not necessarily automatic. And uh, this is a flow process flow diagram where sand late manure is coming in on the upper right-hand corner into the uh, flow diagram. 
and uh, by putting that through uh, equipment that separates sand from manure, um, the farm can reclaim sand, which is shown in the, uh, the right-hand side here, and then put it back underneath the cows. So uh, recycling that sand back around in a, in a way that's beneficial for the environment, beneficial for the cows, and beneficial for the pocketbook. Um, to do that, the, farm, the separation system, the SMS system that's shown there, needs to have a good source of dilution water. And um, by um, taking out, again, more and more fiber, and which would also take out um, nutrients, some of the nutrients anyway, um, we would be able to create a good sand to put back underneath the cow. So um, it's a way that the nutrient uh, removal is tied into um, the cows and having a good, comfortable cow in that particular situation. I think another reason that we may separate nutrients and capture them is to basically um, preserve, uh, to conserve the resources we have. Um, on the left-hand side here is an image of uh, uh, the, the brown is dirt and the white is um, air, and basically showing the nit nitrogen cycle. Um, and I'm not uh, going to go through the details there, but nitrogen um, naturally, basically by um, biological mediation, changes form and uh, moves, naturally moves around, and it cycles itself around in some ways. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is mined, brought to the farm, used, and then it's largely um, not available anymore. Uh, but there, by nutrient manager capture, we can harvest the phosphorus out of manure, um, which is um, the end product of this particular dairy um, is coming off as, as phosphorus rich and can be used uh, in a way that will um, reduce the uh, loss to the environment and increase the revenue to the farm. Um, another option, uh, another reason why we might want to capture nutrients is to increase inter digester adoption. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for co-digestion of manure with off-farm substrates um, at these uh, dairies and other, other animal ag or even just general agricultural facilities. And this happens to be a, a farm in Quebec, uh, not Quebec, Ontario, um, that um, <clears throat> co-mixes manure with uh, uh, off-farm substrates, which is in this tanker truck uh, delivering into the site and then digests into the right and the right here in this uh, black uh, black dome um, structure. And so if we can bring those materials in, co-digest them, we can increase uh, renewable energy production, uh, reduce greenhouse gases, and at the back end of all that, we um, pull the nutrients out and reuse them for uh, growing crops. That's a really good thing. Um, the key here in the states is the amaranth digesters alone are not a profit center for the farm, and very few of them are actually profit neutral or cost neutral. So um, the tipping fees that could come with, or uh, do come with, uh, taking these kind of materials and having them available for co-digestion do help with the economics. Um, and if we can get the nutrients out the back end of that, we can take more materials at our farms. Um, in New York State, um, definitely our governor is interested in growing the dairy business. Um, many of you know that Chobani um, started here and is uh, grown across the country. Um, Bloomberg Business Week last year, February last year, basically proclaimed that New York is the Silicon Valley of yogurt, um, yogurt capital of the country. And um, for those companies to continue to grow, um, they need to have a reliable supply of milk. And the farms, uh, there's opportunity to, to do that. Um, nutrient management uh, is, is, uh, is important uh, to making sure that continues to grow. And as, as time goes on, we'll see more and more need for extracting nutrients so that the industry can grow further. Um, the last slide here on this uh, particular um, opportunity um, in tied to nutrient management is just there's so much, there's only, uh, so much arable land in this, country, in this country and in the world. Uh, we're going to feed more people, and so we need to be more efficient with our nutrients. So the last, these two, not this is the last, these couple of slides here are just basically bringing that all together. Um, just list what I just went through, and I won't go through those per, uh, specifically. Um, I want to state uh, clearly here that, um, that the, the several reasons why a farm may consider, consider nutrient separation or capture are not mutually exclusive, um, but they're rather, but rather they're interrelated. Um, so they're, uh, they, they are not mutually exclusive. Um, what I say is um, nutrient manager capture is going to be part of an integrated manure treatment system. 
Um, and uh, what is that? It's an assembly of manure handling and treatment processes arranged in a strategic fashion to accomplish identified farm water quality and air quality goals and objectives. So um, we're not going to have the same system on every farm. Um, farms are different. Goals are different. Needs are different. Um, but part of the, uh, the integrated system will include uh, nutrient capture. What's been done in New York, um, there has been some work on phos flocculating phosphorus. Um, actually, this slide comes from Dana Kirk at Michigan State, from uh, one of the systems there uh, he was worked with. Um, similar work has been done here, and there's a few farms that have looked at it and tried it. We don't have anybody doing that mainstream that I'm aware of. Um, there's been quite a lot of interest off and on about harvesting ammonia nitrogen from uh, dairy manure. Uh, this is a, a, a shot of a um, system that's commercially available, um, and um, it's been looked at to uh, uh, harvest ammonia nitrogen from uh, post-digestion effluent. And we'll hear more about that uh, today from another speaker. On uh, take-home points, I think uh, there's a few that are worthy of mentioning. Uh, many reasons to separate captured nutrients from manure. Largely, that's the list I went through. Um, I think before we see a uh, large, large uh, adoption or serious consideration by a lot of farms, um, there's a lot more information needed. Um, what's needed is information about all the methods to capture uh, and separate nutrients, and then the how we would plug them all together, what's the best optimal system. So there's information needed on all that stuff. Uh, farmers like to go uh, kick the tires. Um, these are not low investment systems. So the next to kicking the tires, we need to have serious economic numbers to show that they are, they are a valid um, investment a farm could make. So with that being said, um, my statement is there's insufficient uh, consistent profitability in milk um, at this point in time, precluding farms from trying options without outside help. Again, these are very cost-intensive options. Um, we need to get uh, unbiased um, data on the systems and components so that we can uh, understand uh, how well they're working, both uh, physically and from an economic standpoint, and then help the farms be able to make educated decisions. With that, I'm finished.